the business instead of just going along business as usual and, you know, sort of plateauing or going down very slowly. This is a forcing function for you to step back and look at the business and look at whether you want to continue, whether you think it's viable and whether you want to continue with this business. Now, the government has uh, unleashed a, uh, an AIDS package or several AIDS packages. Uh, do you expect businesses will take advantage of that? Absolutely. Yes. I've already talked to people yesterday who have said they're, they're calling their staff and they're bringing some of them back and, and they're happy. I mean, they were crying when they had to lay people off because they worked very hard to get the staff in place and, and to let that evaporate sort of overnight was, was, was really uh, where they had simply had grief about having done it. So some of them have already called some of their team members and asked them to come back. Okay. And of course, there are also government grants available too. So yes. maybe companies should check those. Oh, the, they, I'm surprised how companies have not picked up on the grants that have been available. Either they don't know about them or they don't want to do the paperwork related to them or they don't understand what a gift it is. You don't have to pay that money back. You don't have to pay interest on it. Uh, government isn't asking for equity in your company. It's just surely a gift to enable you to do what you want to do anyway. So, yes, definitely look at the government grants. And what about uh, the banks? I mean, if there's a shortfall, they could always go to the bank for a loan, couldn't they? And the banks would be more than willing to lend them now, wouldn't they? Well, absolutely. Uh, if you, again, the banks are very willing and very definitely want to work with uh, Part of the question for the bank always is, is this a viable business plan? And uh, do, you, do they have a sense that they'll be able to take the business, be able to repay the loan? That's That's got to be a question. They've got to look at the viability. But in many cases where they think the company has been doing well and suddenly it's been run into this brick wall, not, nothing of it's doing, they they will be more than happy to loan money. And as I understand, interest free for six months and you don't have to do the repayments for six months. So that's, again, a gift. You have to have some money to step back, look at the company, put in the systems. Maybe it's paint the restaurant, you know, talk with your employees about what would be the next step for us to take. What should we keep doing? What should we stop doing? How can we better serve our customers? There's a whole set of questions that every business owner should be asking. We, we just sometimes don't have the time to stop doing what we're doing to take a breath and take time out and look at Maybe some businesses need to look laterally. I mean, for example, I've, I've read that car manufacturers in Germany are now making ventilators, for example, and sure. which is really interesting. Now, uh, and I've noticed a lot of companies here are thinking laterally. Uh, I've noticed uh, the other day uh, there's been a growth in uh, businesses now going on to Zoom, such as yoga classes and meditation classes. Right. And Bickford's is making hand sanitizers as our gin companies instead of uh, you know, gin and, and juices. Absolutely, yes. So, so businesses need to think laterally. So do you think many businesses will be doing that? Well, I hope so. That, again, this is an opportunity to bring your key staff back and sit down and think with them, not just keep doing what we've been doing because it's been successful, but to sit down and say, what are the opportunities and what else can we do with the current products or the current machines or the current uh, staff capabilities that we have? And especially, what is it that our customers would value? Value is slightly different than needs and wants. I may need it, I may want it, but I may not buy it. But value means I value it enough to actually pay for it. It takes a lot of courage and brains and, for that matter, well, heart, to actually yeah. lead a company through chaos. What's your advice on that? Well, you have to be able to function in multiple dimensions. You need to be very empathetic to your customers and to your employees and understand what they're going through. People with small children are trying to work and work from home with small children at home, which means different working relationships. Uh, maybe they can't work full time or maybe they have different hours and you have to be more flexible. You have to think hard about what the business opportunities are going forward. And that's where I'm thinking being more strategic, using your brains, looking at the market research, understanding where those opportunities are, because in chaos, there is always opportunity. And then you have to manage your own self. You have to watch that you're getting enough sleep, eating well, don't eat a lot of junk food. I take about five or ten minutes every morning where I just try to sit on my balcony and just be, just we call it meditation, still my mind, because there's lots of chatter, lots of anxiety, lots of things that people are wanting me to do, and I 
I have to keep sure that there's this quiet, you know, the core, the vortex, the integrity, the whoever it is who I am, so that I keep myself together because people need the strength that the leader can provide when the leader is thoughtful, uses brains and heart and courage. And yes, courage. You have to have the courage to start things that you've never done before and the courage to stop things, things that might have worked in the past, which just don't work now. That takes a lot of courage. And that takes a lot of lateral thinking, a lot of lateral thinking and uh, a completely different mindset for so many businesses now, doesn't it? It's a very, very challenging time. Yes, we talk about how to build innovation into the organization. I worry a little bit that people think innovation is a word associated with maybe breakthrough technology or some breakthrough product. But actually, there are 12 different kinds of innovations in in business. You can have innovations in the business model and how you uh, onboard and bring your employees into the into the picture and, and flexible working relationships. There are all kinds of innovations there uh, in terms of, uh, of funding, uh, how you're going to fund your growth. Certainly managing your own internals have been innovations, understanding you know, how to do cloud-based accounting and have your profit and loss and everything at your fingertips. Many, many innovations. And if you bring to bear an innovative mindset where you're encouraging your employees to tell you what they're hearing from customers and you're looking out as the leader at what's going on in the world, what are the trends and, and what are the other competitors doing and what are the new technologies that could possibly be used by your company, you're having bottom-up and top-down innovation, and you're realizing that there's a lot of things you could do, and you have to sort through those. That's your job as leaders, to sort through those opportunities and identify the ones that you can do and will be able to have enough of a customer base to be able to make money. And then once you've chosen those, to be able to have a process that you systematically put it through to be able to come out the other end with either a product or a service that you can offer and that your staff is already and trained in order to produce. Well, Jana Matthews, that's fascinating stuff, and a lot of businesses will be listening to that closely. Thank you very much for your time and wise advice. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And now let's talk to economist Nicholas Gruen. Well, Nicholas Gruen, you say the present crisis points our attention to things we should have been addressing before it happened, and more importantly, some long-term thinking about some of the long-term benefits. Uh, Can you elaborate on that? Uh, Yeah, I guess I don't really want to put it in the frame of complaining at a time like this. So it's really about not wasting the crisis. And what happens when a society, when a system encounters something as big as this is that people have to improvise. And what we're going to what's going to happen if we improvise properly is we're going to notice all kinds of ways in which we've locked down the system and made certain ways of doing things business as usual that actually are very inefficient and are holding us back. So let me give you a very simple example. When medical services are stretched, we're going to find that we don't have enough doctors and we maybe don't even have enough nurses. Now, one of the obvious things to do if you're in a desperate situation is to allow, when the alternatives are worse, you, you may then start thinking about allowing nurses to do things that only doctors uh, used to do. Now, when you think about that, in fact, the situation that we have is, is not one where we have very good rules which define the demarcation between what nurses do and doctors do. Those rules have a great deal of politics to them, and, the, and the, the doctors' union called the... Uh, uh, AMA, the uh, the Australian uh, Medical Association, I think that's what it's called, will mount campaigns, as lawyers do, to maintain their monopoly on certain things. And so as uh, things become desperate, if they become desperate, or in preparation in case they become desperate, those kinds of questions will be asked, should be asked. And really, we, what we should be trying to do is build some sort of evidence-based demarcation between doc, what doctors do and what nurses do, and that's not really what we have at the moment. So, so that's a, a small example of the kind of regulatory uh, rationalisation that we might have. And again, I stress, I'm not really arguing for more free market regulation or anything like that. 
I'm arguing for less politically driven regulation, regulation that's more evidence based. And there are uh, there are plenty of examples where uh, we could uh, where we could be improving things in that regard, but with particular regard to medicine, developing vaccines and so on. Well, it certainly shows us we need to be better at testing vaccines. Mm. So uh, one of the things, and I certainly don't claim to be an expert on this, but when I've looked at the ways in which we regulate for pharmaceutical safety, uh, the the crude way of saying this, and I know a lot of economists, it would be easy to say this to economists, which is, oh, well, we err too much on the side of safety. And in a situation like this, uh, taking more risks makes more sense. I think it's not, uh, I, I think one can uh, go about this more with a scalpel than with a machete. And one of the things that I've always noticed about pharmaceutical regulation is that two very important issues get tangled up into one. And one issue uh, that's on everyone's mind is safety. But the other issue, which is extremely important, is efficacy, how well drugs work. Now, partly because our, our pharmaceutical market is a regulated one, it's not a it's, it's not a, a free one, uh, which makes quite a bit of sense. And because governments pay a lot for pharmaceuticals, governments want to know not just that a drug is safe, but also that it's efficacious, that it works better than some other drug. And so clinical trials, which can uh, involve costs of hundreds of millions of dollars, tend to run safety and efficacy together. They're not completely together. Uh, safety is the primary objective of early trials, and as you do more trials, they can focus more on e- efficacy. But one could be quite a bit more radical about that, and one could say that the mo- certainly at a time like this, the most critical thing is safety, and once, once we understand the safety implications of a drug, we understand how to use it safely and so on, then we can go about efficacy in a pretty relaxed kind of way. So, for instance... Uh, hydroxychloroquine, if I've pronounced it correctly, is a, an old malaria drug, which various people think may be useful uh, to treatment, I believe, yeah, in this situation. So I think we should be running clinical trials in hospitals, quite casual ones. We know how to use the drug fairly safely, and we could be giving one part of the uh, population inside a hospital. So let's say we're talking about the doctors and nurses, we could be doing a randomised controlled trial within a hospital that could all be, all the data could be publicly provided and quite quickly we would be generating good evidence uh, about the use of this safe drug for this purpose. And if you multiply that with all the other possible way, possible sensible experiments we could be doing, we could be doing those right now, we could be getting the data out there, uh, other countries could be doing it as well, and so on. And you can imagine a very fast process of learning uh, coming about. So so that's, uh, that's an example of the kind of thing we should be doing. And I'm not even saying that I know that much about ways in which regulations stop us doing it, but I know that a lot of standard procedures won't be very energetically going out and doing that sort of thing. And I think that could be of great benefit now. But but I would hope that it would then carry over into a period when we're not in crisis. Uh, if it's properly supervised, we can maintain safety standards and really amp up the rate at which learning takes place about what's useful in what circumstances. It might also address the blockages we have between the states and Canberra working together and making make it work more seamlessly. Uh, it might, yes, it, that, that, might be, that might be one of the things that it could do. Uh, certainly the whole idea of everyone, in being inv- everyone involved in this being part of a knowledge commons is actually an idea that, Toy- uh, that, that I take from Toyota. So... One of the things that Toyota does uh, and pioneered is the idea that all of its suppliers are part of a knowledge commons. So if you become a supplier to Toyota, uh, essentially what happens is Toyota offer you a lot of technical services from their own engineers and they open their factories to you. 
and their and much of their engineering facilities to you. You do the same for them, and the kicker is that you also do it for all other suppliers to Toyota. So while the sort of immediate competitive dynamics of say two suppliers suggest that they wouldn't want to cooperate, they're all part of a larger cooperative uh, arrangement in which everybody benefits more than they uh, more than any competitive uh, loss that they suffer. Oh, how would you do that with states working with Canberra? Oh, well, you would just uh, come up with a protocol for these kinds of trials and uh, ask states if they want to participate in the Knowledge Commons. They're going to gain from it uh, and they'll also donate to it. So that's that's an example. And, I mean, it's I guess it's well, I, I, it's probably quite wrong to think of state. I mean, it won't be states that are participating in these trials. It will be various agencies within the state, some private sector, or yes, some private sector, some uh, not-for-profit, uh, some hospitals and so on. So these are institutions and you're trying, and, and in a sense, you're making, if you can draw these institutions into being enthusiastic participants, you make the state, whether it's at the state level or the Commonwealth level, you make these governments facilitators rather than sovereigns who are bossing everyone around. And that's obviously a much more, uh, a much better role for governments to adopt uh, and a much, a much more effective way for learning to take place and to be shared uh, as widely as possible, both around the country, but internationally. And finally, uh, speaking of learning, what does it say about the future of universities now that they've all gone online? Yes, well, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, MOOCs, uh, massive open online courses, are uh, a bit of a thing, aren't they? Because uh, universities have uh, have to turn away students to keep the, for social distancing reasons, and the idea of teaching over the net is an easy one to talk about, but the delivery of education online has, or a bit like teleworking, the 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 actual performance, the actual moving into this area, has always lagged behind the hype. It's actually been much slow. We've been much slower to get online than you might have thought. Now. You can say that I think the reasons are that all the obstacles are quite soft social obstacles, if you like. People don't particularly like learning it all at home. They need reinforcement by teachers and peers and so on. So there are a great many soft skills, if you like, or, so, or soft aspects of our temperament that need to be designed for. And capitalism's been extremely good at designing for various addictive parts of our temperament uh, and getting us clicking on links and Facebook and YouTube and so on make a, make a lot of money out of doing that. And universities uh, and deliverers of education also in schools need to try to learn some of those soft skills, but they're not trying to deliver addiction even, uh, I mean, perhaps they are to some extent by gamifying education. But at least that's supposed to be a means to an end of edu to the end of education. And I don't think we're very far advanced in that direction, uh, I guess, because there's been less money to be made. But uh, now is a great time to start learning. Well, Nicholas Green, thank you very much for your time. It's very, very informative. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Leon. So what's happening in the news? Well, spare a thought for plutocrats when Forbes publishes its annual ranking of billionaires. They tend to be hit harder by market routes than mere millionaires because their portfolios are loaded with riskier assets. Most are nursing hefty losses inflicted by COVID-19. A few, though, have done well. The net worth of Jeff Bezos, Amazon's founder, has risen by almost $3 billion since the start of 2020, as demand for its goods and services has boomed. And Eric Wan, Boss of Zoom is richer by the same amount, thanks to an explosion in video conferencing. And Global Aviation's peak body, the International Air Transport Association, or the IOTA, has put 11.2 million jobs at risk in the Asia-Pacific region alone, as it pleads for government to support the hard-hit industry. The International Air Transport Association said worldwide job losses could reach 25 million if urgent financial support in the form of tax relief 
loans or loan guarantees did not come soon. And ANZ Australian job ads fell 10.3% in March to be down 18.2% for the year. In trend terms, job ads declined 2% for the month and 13.1% for the year. This fall of more than 10% in March was the largest monthly fall since January 2009 during the GFC. Most of the fall occurred over the second half of March as Australian COVID-19 cases escalated, restrictions on movement tightened and shutdowns of non-essential services broadened. And Australia's trade surplus fell in February with the decline in exports outpacing the fall in imports. The Commonwealth Government's ban on travellers from China to Australia looks like it was a key contributor with travel exports down over 14% for the month. This is the largest percentage fall in almost two decades. A decline in resource exports, primarily from iron ore exports and non-monetary gold, was the other main reason exports fell. And two thirds or 66% of Australian businesses reported that their turnover or cash flow had reduced as a result of COVID-19, according to the latest figures from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. In a survey taken by the ABS in the week from March 30, Nearly half of trading businesses, 47%, made changes to their workforce in the last two weeks as a result of COVID-19. As much as 70% of accommodation and food services temporarily reduced staff work hours. Two in five businesses, or 38%, changed how they delivered their products or services, including shifting to online services. Over a third of businesses have renegotiated their lease and rental arrangements, and a quarter have deferred loan repayments. And businesses will be able to reduce workers' hours under a new... JobKeeper enabling stand down under changes the Coalition Government brought to Parliament on Wednesday. Attorney General Christian Porter also confirmed that employers will legally be able to ask the workers to take most of their leave while still receiving the $1,500 a fortnight job subsidy from the Government. But workers must be left with their final two weeks' leave and cannot be forced to use that up. Mr Porter has thrashed out the details of the new JobKeeper program with the Australian Council of Trade Unions. But he said they had agreed to disagree on casuals, with the government refusing to budge on its insistence that to qualify for the JobKeeper payment, a casual needs to have worked with the same employer for at least 12 months. A number of non-Australians on working visas will also miss out. New research reveals the impact COVID-19 is having on the mental health of Australian New Zealand's workforce, with 45% of workers saying their mental health has declined over the last few weeks. In a study conducted by Qualtrics, a key finding reveals 65% of workers are feeling more stressed and two-thirds are feeling more anxious at their jobs. Additional key findings include the drivers for a decline in mental health are due to anxiety, 24%, being worried about their job, 20%, stress, 18%, working from home, 9%, and feeling less busy, 7%. A third of ANZ respondents say they're feeling less productive working from home. Feelings of social isolation, 14%, is the hardest thing about working from home, followed by feeling connected to a team, 9%. And half of respondents said having a pet has helped reduce their anxiety. The research surveyed 2,757 workers from the US, UK, France, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore between the 27th of March and the 2nd of April. And the Australian economy is set to contract by almost 4% this calendar year, and unemployment will spike to almost 9% as the country grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic before rebounding sharply at the end of 2021. The Australian Financial Review's Economist survey for the March quarter showed economists are forecasting a median 3.9% contraction in calendar 2020. The virus has claimed tens of thousands of lives around the world, caused 1 million infections, and has already taken a toll on global growth, with the latest US unemployment rate soaring to its highest point since 2009 at 4.4%. Australia won't escape the economic fallout. For the current fiscal year, which won't show the full extent of the COVID-19 hit to the economy given it started in the third quarter, the median economist forecast is for a contraction of 1%. The economic pain is expected to continue through fiscal 2021, with a medium forecast for a contraction of 1.5%. Now, two, two straight quarters of negative growth are widely regarded as the definition of a recession, something Australia hasn't experienced since 1991. It won't be until the end of 2021 that the economy will move back into growth. The median forecast for the end of 2021 is for a rebound to 3.2%. Every economist in the survey expects the unemployment rate to rise significantly from the current level of 5.1%, and the median forecast is that rate will hit 8.5% by the end of June. The jobless rate is expected to fall back slightly by the end of the year to 
Inflation is expected to stay well below the Reserve Bank of Australia's 2% to 3% target ban, the economists believe. It will hit 1.4% by the end of June, according to the median economist's forecast, and fall further 1.25% by the end of the year. And the millions of Australians suddenly working from home to combat the coronavirus pandemic could result in workers' compensation claims skyrocketing. Occupational rehabilitation provider Rehab Management has recorded a 17% increase in mental health claims since mid-January when the coronavirus started to emerge. This is across its workers' compensation, compulsory third-party and government agency clients, and includes mental health as both a primary and secondary condition. Meanwhile, workplace health and safety experts warn employers must act now to avoid a spike in physical injuries from poor ergonomic workstations, decreased movement and trip hazards from electrical cords or children's toys. Rehab Management Chief Executive Marcella Romero said she expected mental health claims to double over the next six weeks as more people are forced to stay home. If sustained, it could go up significantly over the longer term, as it did during the global financial crisis in 2008. And police officers were deployed to supermarkets after Woolworths and Coles pledged to dramatically escalate their social distancing policies in an effort to stem the spread of COVID-19 ahead of the Easter rush. From Monday, Woolworths and Coles limited the number of customers in stores and shoppers needed to wait in cordoned off queues outside the stores until people inside left. Traditionally, the Thursday in the lead up to Easter is one of our busiest times in store. We ask our customers to pre-plan their Easter shopping to avoid the usual Thursday spike in numbers, said Woolworths Managing Director of Supermarkets, Claire Peters. Customer limits will be specific to each location and based on the size of the store. Our store managers will use common sense discretion to manage this in the interest of safety. Ms Peace has conceded Easter this year will be different, but says staff would do their best to manage the demand for essential items. Security guards and police officers are expected to manage the queues at peak times and enforce the 1.5 metre social distancing rules. And blood products giant CSL has joined forces with Japanese rival Takeda in an unprecedented move to develop a COVID-19 plasma treatment that uses the antibodies of recovered patients to help the seriously ill. The therapy, which is being developed from scratch, will be a hyperimmune treatment requiring plasma donations from many individuals who fully recovered from the respiratory virus and whose blood contains antibodies that fight COVID-19. Using blood products from people who have recovered from an illness to help the critically ill is an old approach that had been used against polio. Convalescent plasma therapies were also used in the effort against SARS, MERS and Ebola. When someone contracts a virus or receives a vaccine, their immune system develops antibodies or proteins that bind to parts of a virus to, an, to prevent infection. This is known as immune, active immunity. It can, it can take someone a week or so to start producing antibodies when they're infected with the virus for the first time. But if they contract it a second time, their immune system responds to the virus more quickly. Hyperimmune therapies like the one being developed by CSL Takeda Consortium are a form of passive immunity and are designed to help people who cannot synthesize the antibodies. The alliance was formed with the idea that by working collectively, the time to market for a new therapy could be significantly reduced. But the timing is dependent on numerous unknown factors, including the rate of convalescent plasma collection and re regulatory approval. Hypothetically, it is possible a SARS CoV-2 plasma therapy could be on the market ahead of a vaccine. The question is whether other companies will join their alliance. And sales at upmarket department store David Jones have slumped nearly 20% over March due to the impact of the coronavirus, though its stores will remain trading for now. David Jones' South African parent company Woolworths holding updated investors on the retailer's performance on Monday night, saying the company had seen a significant reduction in foot traffic throughout March as the government's response to the virus intensified. This resulted in a 19% in comparable sales throughout March, which has continued into April, with Woolworths focusing on stimulating trade, reducing inventory and generating cash. David Jones' comparable sales for the first nine weeks of the calendar year were up 0.5% prior to the impact of the virus. The company's downbeat results can't come as a poor omen for the rest of the retail sector, especially rival department store Meyer, which closed 60 stores and stood down 200 workers two weeks ago. However, David Jones' drop in sales appears to be at the lower end, with other Australian retailers reporting falls of between 50 and 70% in recent weeks. Stablemate Country Road Group, which consists of Country Road, Mimco, Trenary, Witchery and Politics, weathered such a drop over the last two weeks of March, with sales down to 60%. Overall, sales for Country Road Group declined, 
32.3% in March. The company closed its stores across Australia and stood down 5,000 employees in, on March 28, as its smaller format stores were unable to comply with social distancing laws. Woolworths indicated it would apply for the government's JobKeeper payments. And petrol and diesel supplier Caltex will temporarily shut down its only oil refinery and will slash at least $50 million in capital investments in the face of slumping demand for fuels due to COVID-19. The company also advised it will examine options for an outright sale of core freehold retail sites in, in parallel with its preparations to spin off a 49% interest in its sites. The Leeton refinery in Brisbane will be shut down next month as a planned outage for maintenance work is brought forward. The plant, one of only four refineries remaining around the country, will only be restarted when margin conditions have sufficiently re recovered, Caltex said on Monday, citing weak refining margins that are creating operating cash flow challenge lighten. Caltex reiterated its, ex its expectation that jet fuel demand will drop 80 to 90 per cent due to flight restrictions and added that it had started to see reductions in retail petrol demand of, of 30 to 50 per cent and in diesel of 20, 10 to 30 per cent compared to last year. Demand reductions at Caltex's international reparations in New Zealand and Philippines have been greater due to higher levels of government restrictions. And Flight Centre is cutting harder into its store network, chopping 800 outlets globally while raising $700 million to ride out the pandemic throttling of the travel industry. The cuts eliminate almost half of the outlets catering to leisure travellers at Flight Centre and are part of a move to reduce costs by almost 70% at the Brisbane-based travel agency. And BHP's frontline mine workers have been told they could be eligible for workers' compensation should they contract the coronavirus on the job highlighting the exposure faced by all types of Australian companies whose essential employers continue to work through the pandemic. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has given mine sites and camps an exemption from the social distancing rules being applied to other sectors, such as the requirement for indoor venues to have a minimum of four square metres of space for each person, and for restaurants to cease operating. Mining companies like BHP and Rio Tinto have implemented a swathe of social distancing and hygiene measures to ensure workers' health is not compromised by the communal nature of life in mine camps, nor the logistical realities of fly-in, fly-out or FIFO work. However, BHP indicated in an internal memo circulated on April 2 that it could face workers' compensation claims, saying eligibility for compensation would depend on circumstances under which the employer contracted the virus. It is believed the same legal vulnerability could be faced by any company whose employer contracts the virus in the course of their work. BHP said in the memo that a virus contraction on the job could, would not be counted as a lost time injury. An ASX-listed dentistry group, 1300 Smiles Limited, has temporarily shut half of its practices, has the rest opened on a part-time basis, and stood down most of its staff. It is also negotiating with landlords for rent relief. The group, which operates 31 practices in Queensland, Sydney and Adelaide, said it had been trading better than expected up until late March, but government restrictions amid the coronavirus pandemic had caused major upheaval in the past week. Large rival Pacific Smiles stood down most of its staff last week and temporarily shut 76 of its 93 surgeries in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and the Australian Capital Territory. 1300 Smiles Managing Director Dr Darrell Holmes said the company would aim to subsidise wages through the Federal Government's JobKeeper program for staff who'd been stood down. Most dentists and support staff have either been stood down or are taking annual leave. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Greg McClarty, the founder and managing director of Two Hands, a company that exports lobsters to China. With COVID-19, the Two Hands system allows fishers, chefs and restaurant owners to bypass the unethical Chinese fish markets and have seafood delivered directly to restaurants. This is a solution to mitigate the chances of food tampering or fraud, which is rampant in China. And then I'll be talking to AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver, analysing how the markets are responding to COVID-19. In the meantime, you can find me on Twitter at TalkingBizBLZ, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all a safe and healthy...